Get up singing, and may I still be singing when the sun goes down. And may I sing as I'm on my deathbed, sustaining grace. Amen. Amen. All right, we started last week doing a little series on the covenants of God, and tonight we're going to pick up and continue to turn in the book of Exodus, chapter 19. There are 25 verses in that chapter. I'm going to read them, and we're going to share some thoughts with you about the covenant God made with Moses on Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 19, beginning with verse number 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they unto the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom, a priest, and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and he called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces, and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in the thick of a cl thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai and, there shall set bound, that, and you shall set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you go not up unto the mount or touch the border of it, Whosoever touches the mount shall surely be put to death. There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man. It shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. It came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trump, its trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood on the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount, and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake 
unto them. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the covenant God made with Moses at Mount Sinai. The covenants God made with individuals and with nations usually came after a dramatic event. Think for it. When did God make the covenant with Noah? Right after the flood that killed the rest of the human population. When did God make the covenant with Abraham? Right after they had been delivered from the effect of the Tower of Babel. You remember in Genesis 11 where God came down and judged them and confused the languages? And they were scattered abroad in chapter 12 is when God selects Abraham and begins his work with him and he made his covenant with Abraham. Now, God's covenant with Moses comes right after they have been delivered from the bondage in Egypt. And so every one of the covenants come after a really dramatic time in the life of the people of God. I wonder what's going to have to happen before people in America want to start making promises to God. Before we want to make a covenant with God. God is a covenant making and a covenant keeping God. And I want you to notice several things with me tonight about the covenant he made with Moses here on Mount Sinai. Number one, the covenant was initiated by God. Look at verse 4. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bare them on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. God reminded them of what he had just brought them through. And if you look at the deliverance from the Egyptians, God's miracle power was on display throughout the whole event. You remember all the ten plagues that came and all the... Last uh, plague was the death of the firstborn across Egypt, none in the land of Goshen where the Israelites were camped. And then when they left, crossed the uh, Red Sea on dry ground and then destroyed the Egyptian army by bringing it back together. I, as you look, you have to say, God has really blessed these people. He said, I want you to know that I have been at work with you. He said, I have brought you unto myself. I like the terminology he used when he said, I brought you on eagle's wings. Uh, being born on eagle's wings speaks of protection and provision, and he brought them safely as if they were floating on the back of an eagle into his presence. And he brought them to himself because he wanted to spend time with them. They were his chosen people, and he wanted to do special things with them and for them. As a matter of fact, God's in the process of drawing all men to himself today because he not only has a plan for the nation Israel, he has a plan for you and for me and every other human being. So the first thing about the covenant God made with Moses and the children of Israel at Mount Sinai is the covenant was initiated by God. Number two, the covenant was conditional. Look at the first part of verse 5. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure to me. Do you hear the condition? Now let's go back and let's think for a minute. Was there any co condition made with the covenant God gave to Noah? No. Actually, God just made a promise. I will never destroy the world by water again. And here's my rainbow, and that's the sign of the covenant. Didn't matter what Israel did, he said, I'll just never do it again. That's a, that's a, a covenant I'm making with you, unconditional. Well, when God made his covenant with uh, Abraham, it was not conditional. I've chosen you. I've chosen your seed, and I am going to give you this land. It is yours. And there was no condition to it. 
Next week we're going to study the covenant God made with David. He said, I'm going to make out of your seed someone who will rule over the house of Israel forever. No condition. I'm going to do it. But when he made the covenant with Noah, I mean uh, with Moses, he said, if you will obey me, then I will do it. And, and what God was really saying is, I cannot do my part unless you're willing to do your part. So it's a conditional covenant. And if you know much about the Old Testament stories of Israel, they often broke the covenant of God. And yet God continued to bless them and bring them back to himself time and time again. There may have been some time of punishment, some time of exile, but in every case, he brought them back to himself. So it was a uh, covenant initiated by God himself. It was a covenant that was conditional, but the covenant was also a call to be a special people. The last part of verse 5, he says, uh, that you shall be to me a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God said, I'm calling you to be to me something special that no other nation is. You are to be a peculiar or unique treasure for God. Something like nothing else. You're going to be my people like nobody else is going to be my people. They were to be different from all the other nations. He said, now I own the whole world. It's all mine. All the earth is mine. Everybody belongs to me. But I've chosen you, and I've chosen you to be a very special treasure to me, and I've chosen you to be very uh, unique, from, different from all the other nations. Listen as I read Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. This is where God explains it a little bit more in detail. Chapter 7, beginning with verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto him above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God which keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments unto a thousand generations. God said, I have chosen you to be very special to me. You're a very unique treasure. And it's not because you were such a great nation, had all these great characteristics. No, you were just a little bitty nation, but I chose you. And one of the things God chose to do through the nation Israel was to reveal himself to the world. He wanted them to know him and relate to others by how they have come to know God and in a sense sharing with them what it's like to be the people of God. So that they too, we'll talk about that more later, they were to be a kingdom of priests. Well, what is a priest? He's the guy who offers the sacrifice and, and comes into God's presence on behalf of others. Well, he said, I want you to be a kingdom, a priest. I want all of you to be able to come before me in prayer and sacrifice. They were to be a, a holy nation. They were to be known by their godly character. Let me stop here and just interject something to you. When you look at the nation Israel today, you don't see much of this, do you? And that's why a lot of people have a hard time understanding God's covenants. God's covenant with the nation of Israel to own the land of the Holy Land, the, the land of Israel, is unconditional. 
his plan to have someone rule over the nation Israel that will be a blessing to the whole world is unconditional. Now, they are in disbelief or unbelief right now and in rebellion against God, and are they paying for it? Is the nation of Israel suffering right now? No nation is being attacked and maligned like the nation of Israel. Per capita, you'll probably find more atheists in Israel right now than you can find in any other country. But as we close this session tonight, I want to show, show you that God hasn't thrown them away. He's got plans for them. He's going to bring them back. But they were to be a holy nation known for their godly character. They were to be known as the people of God. Boy, I really like it, what it says uh, in verse 3 where it says, Moses went up to God. Boy, what a trip. What an awesome thing to go meet with God. And then look, if you will, in verse 17, it says, Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. What an awesome experience to meet with God on that holy mount. Now, these verses that I just read to you about what God said He was going to do with the nation of Israel, how that they were supposed to be a special people to Him, peculiar, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. Have you noticed that that's also referred to in the New Testament? As a matter of fact, Peter applies this verse to the church. Let me read to you 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Let me tell you a little bit about the relationship of the church with the nation Israel. The nation Israel was praying for their Messiah. They were anticipating His coming for hundreds of years. And when He came, they didn't recognize Him. They thought He'd come as a great king with great power and put down the Romans and set up the throne in Israel. They didn't understand anything about his first coming and his second coming. They only thought of him coming and ruling. They rejected him. He came unto his own. His own received him not. And you remember when the Apostle Paul was doing his ministry, the first thing he'd do when he go, goes into a city, he goes to the synagogue of the Jews and he begins to share. But they kept kicking him out, throwing him out. Until finally, he says, okay, since you deem yourselves unworthy, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And I'm going to read in a few minutes how that, that's part of God's plan. He's working on the Gentiles, and actually, we are a special group. We are the bride of Christ, the church, that will rule with him a thousand years. Israel's in disbelief. In rebellion, God's called the church to be the witness to the world for now. So not only is the covenant initiated by God and the covenant is conditional, the covenant is a call for Israel to be a special people, the covenant involves the keeping of the law. If you read chapter 20, you know what we find in chapter 20 of the book of Exodus. There's the Ten Commandments. That's not the whole law, but it's the summary of the law. I believe firmly that the Ten Commandments ought to be taught today in our schools. Everywhere you turn, it's the best principles of how to live and govern a people you can find. But it involves the keeping of the law because he made it conditional on the front end. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then I will bless you. This covenant established a standard of moral conduct and of civil law that has been copied by government after government. 
If you know anything about our Constitution, you'll find that much of it can be traced back to the teachings of the law of God on the moral character of the nation Israel. This covenant also involved a lot of sacrificial giving of animals. There was a shedding of a lot of blood. Many people call it a bloody religion. But the Bible clearly teaches that there is no forgiveness of sins unless blood has been shed to pay for it. That's why it was essential for Christ to shed his blood on the cross. That's why we are focusing on that on Sunday mornings to make us better understand and appreciate what Jesus did when he shed his blood on the cross. If he's not your savior, your own blood will have to be shed for your sins. You'll have to pay yourself throughout eternity. So the system of offering lambs, goats, Turtle doves. What was it doing? Do you know it never took away the sin? What it did, it rolled it back for one more year. And the, and the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, offered sprinkled blood on the mercy seat, which would roll away the sins of the people for another year. It never took it away. It just kept prolonging it. It all pointed to one thing. The coming of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When Jesus was identified by John, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. We don't have to have sacrifices anymore. That sacrifice satisfied the demand of God forever. That covenant revealed the holiness of of God. I read to you on purpose the last part of this chapter to tell you what God had to say about the holiness involved in this experience. When God came down on Mount Sinai, he warned Moses repeatedly, tell them don't touch the mountain, don't come up here, they'll die. There was the, the glory of God and there was smoke and there was thunder and there was lightning. The presence of God created a lot of disturbance in the atmosphere and it brought fear to their hearts. God warned them, this is a holy occasion. You'll lose your life if you do not treat it right. It scared them so much that they actually asked Moses to talk to them and then go talk to God so that they wouldn't have to talk to God. Let me read it to you in chapter 20, uh, verses uh, 18 and 19. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off, and they said unto Moses, Speak thou unto us, and we will hear. Let not God speak with us, lest we die. And let me go on and read. It says, Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that you sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. This was a covenant that revealed the holiness of God. It set a moral standard, and you can read all the ways of what you cannot do and what you can do and how you're to re relate to one another and how you're to relate to God. And there were several things about this covenant that brought fear to the people. Can I give you one example? Did everybody get to make a tour to the Holy of Holies? If anybody, even any priest, went into the Holy of Holies, he was immediately struck dead. Only the high priest. You remember when John the Baptist's dad, Zacharias, went in? 
and he hadn't come out. When the angel was talking to him, he, he tarried, and they thought he had been struck dead. They wore robes with pomegranates and bells on the bottom so that the people outside could hear that they're still moving. It put fear in their heart to be in the presence of God. Also, this covenant established a government with God as its leader. They were not to be like the other nations. They were not to elect a king. God was their leader. As a matter of fact, you remember, <clears throat> they went through the period of uh, the different judges, and then the people, because of Eli's son's sins, he was a leader at the temple, and because his sons set such a poor example, they wanted to break from God's plan. Eli should have straightened out his sons. But they said, give us a king that we may be like the other nations. And Samuel was very upset, said, no, 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 no. God is your leader. You're, you're to respond directly to God. And when Samuel went and talked to God about it, God said, don't get so upset, Samuel. They didn't reject you, they rejected me. Go ahead and give them a king, but warn them. You'll find all this in 1 Samuel chapter 8. If you want to read that chapter, uh, you'll find out what God said. Warn them what's going to happen if you get a king, but if you want a king, you're going to get one. And so he let them have a king. And in this covenant, there was to be no distinction between the civil law and the moral law or the religious law. It was all alike. Guess what? They didn't know anything about separation of church and state. Maybe we could learn a lesson from them. But it was just God's law. And this is how you live as God's people. And all the leaders they had were chosen by God and were to be subject to God. So this was a covenant where God was to be their leader. And then this covenant included a plan for them to share their faith with other nations. When God called Abraham, one of the things he said is that you're going to become a blessing to all nations. What they were to do was to share with people the way to live pleasing to God the way God wants people to live and treat one another. Did you know there was a time when America had that reputation in the world? They're a Christian nation. They live according to the Bible. You won't find many countries who think we are a Christian nation now. But that's what they were to do. To live in such a way that people say, well, that's the people of God. That's the way they live because that's the way God told them to live. That's the way God wants them to act. They're God's people. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 13, God says, I'm going to bless them that bless you, curse them that curse you, and in your seed shall all the nations of the world be blessed. Well, have we been blessed by Abraham and his seed? Let me throw out some suggestions. The Jewish descendants of Abraham gave us our moral code, gave us our Bible, gave us our Savior, and gave us the promise of future blessings because we're going to get to rule with the king of the Jews one day as his bride. Just a few closing comments and I'll be through. This covenant was to be in force until Christ came to fulfill its demands. It was made clear by the Lord in the Sermon on the Mount that He did not come to cancel the covenant of Moses. He was to fulfill it. Matthew 5, 
17 and 18, he said, I did not come to uh, cancel the law. I came to fulfill it to every jot and tittle. He completed the fulfillment of the covenant with Moses. By the way, the church did not replace Israel as a covenant people. Now, I'm going to share with you a scripture that I think is pertinent, even crucial, to this discussion. It's in Acts chapter 15. I don't know what your feelings today might be toward the Jewish people, but I want to give you a secret. If you want to get on God's good side, be good to, Jew to Jewish people. That's just a secret. You need to know that. In, in Acts chapter 15, beginning with verse, uh, excuse me, Acts chapter 15, verses 14 through 17. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. That's what's happening. Uh, Simon was the first one to go preach to Cornelius and the Gentiles, and God revealed that he wanted the Gentiles to be part of the group to be saved. And to this agree all the words of the prophets as it is written after this, after he takes out a people, after the church is completed, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. When the church goes out, God's going to go back to dealing with the nation Israel. And there's going to be a national revival like no nation has ever seen. And Israel's going to accept Jesus as her Messiah. One other scripture I want to read to you from Romans chapter 11, verses 24 through 27, to prove uh, that we, we don't replace Israel. We've been grafted in. Uh, Romans 11, 24. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches, that's talking about Israel, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And then all Israel shall be saved, it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer that shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I shall take away their sins. So there's an event that's waiting to happen before God begins to move back with the nation Israel. When the, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, in other words, when the last Gentile who's going to make up the church is saved, we don't know who that is and when that is, but when the Gentile bride is complete, we're going out and he's going back and begin to work on the nation Israel. That's the Mosaic Covenant God made with Israel. And folks, isn't it amazing? The set of rules put down in that covenant somewhere... Uh, around 4,000 years ago are still valid ways of living today. Our God's a wise God. The things that God ta taught Israel to do had health issues as well as spiritual and moral issues. And if, if we would just study more what God taught Israel to do, we'd be a lot better off as a people. I'm glad God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. Next week, we're going to look at the covenant God made with David. And it's going to be exciting as we think about the fulfillment of that covenant when King Jesus comes back riding on a white horse. Amen. Let's stand. We'll be dismissed with prayer. Father, thank you for allowing us to share from your word tonight. Help us to understand better your dealings with man.
that we might better live pleasing in your sight. Thank you for the covenant you made with Moses and the people of Israel at Sinai and what came out of that covenant. Help us to live today that we might please you because we are a peculiar people to you as the bride of Christ. Help us to honor the Lord Jesus, our bridegroom. Guide us and keep us safe until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen.